using Mariah Aitken and more private lives. There's a new season of features coming to BBC Two. In Enigma, Ludovic Kennedy examines the disappearance, for no apparent reason, of five people. Mrs. Betty Wilson on February the 6th, 1978. That day she left home and family for good. She had with her her husband's love letters. She walked to the main road that runs between Brighton and Seaford and there waited for the Seaford bus. She was leaving behind a husband to whom she'd been married for 30 years and three grown-up children. At 9.30 p.m. on Christmas Eve 1975, a man called Peter Gibbs, piloting a Cessna aircraft like that one there, took off from this airstrip with the object of making a night practice landing. On the afternoon of April the 8th, 1969, 13-year-old April Fab, youngest daughter of Ernest Fab, a building labourer, and his wife Olive, left her home behind me there to bicycle to her married sister's house at the village of Roughton, some three miles away. This lay-by lies some 10 miles south of Inverness on the main Edinburgh Road. And here at about 10 p.m. on the night of November the 12th, 1976, a passing bus driver noticed in the lay-by here behind me a blazing car. This car, a BMW, belonged to a woman named Rennie McRae, who had left Inverness earlier that day with her three-year-old son, Andrew. And from that time to this, neither Rene nor Andrew has ever been seen again. Enigma starts next Wednesday at 9.40. Now, this Wednesday's programme's on BBC One shortly, Shoestring. Tonight, Radio West's Private Eye takes a close look at the motives of a religious cult. Here on Two, we begin a new series of the Old Boy Network, in which veteran entertainers reminisce about their careers in show business. Tonight, a man who first appeared on the stage in 1911. Comedian, dancer and songwriter, Leslie Cerrone. When I say tweet, tweet, shush, shush, now, now, come, come. When the wife tells me where I ought to be, do I look all meek and mum? No, I lift up my finger and I say tweet, tweet, shush, shush, now, now, come, come. I when I say tweet, tweet, shush, shush, now, now, Baby screams and shatters my dreams Do I look all sour and plump? No, I let up my finger and I say Tweet, tweet, shush, shush, now, 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 Well, as you probably know, I was born in 1897 I was born in Surbiton, and my father, his name was William Rawston Fry, and he was a very fine portrait painter. He had several of his works accepted by the royal family, and Cerrone, of course, was my mother's maiden name, and she came from a place in America called Yonkers on the Hudson River. And my sister May, uh, she, she was one of the, one of George Edwards' gaiety girls. Lovely, isn't she? And uh, she, uh, she used to understudy uh, Gertie Miller. She married the great composer Lionel Moncton, who unfortunately died. And then she, she married the Earl of Dudley. Anyway. George Edwards was a wonderful man, and he put on wonderful productions. He had a, a principal comedian, funny little man, actually he had hair like a skinhead, so he was way ahead of the times, wasn't he? 
and uh, he used to ride to the theatre on an old bone shaker of a bike and he had a natural lisp. My sister said to him one day, she said, oh, excuse me, Mr. Payne, but why do you talk like that? He said, don't be silly, my dear. He said, I always talk like that. Always speak like that. And he, he used to sing a song called Two Little Sausages. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it went a bit like this. One in the corner of a ham and beef job, two little sausages fat. One with the lady and the other with the gentleman, sausages bad like that. What a pair of silly little sausages, theirs was a happy, happy fate. For they cuddled up together in the cold and frosty weather, both on the same cold plate, but it wasn't a very cold plate. <laughs> Of course, truthfully, I never wanted to go on the stage when I was a kid. Honestly, I wanted to be a drummer in the guards. Can you imagine me, not tall enough to pick radishes? <laughs> However, another sister of mine named Mabel, who was also a very clever painter and photographer, she played the piano as well. She used to play the piano for me. You know, families always think their kid, the sun shines out of their... <laughs> and of course I used to do my little turns and things but she, she used to enter me for amateur competitions and I always used to win them well the last one I went in for that was held at, uh, at the, the music hall the Grand Clapham and this competition was organised by uh, Reynolds, Reynolds they're called Reynolds Ragtime Competition and the first prize was five pounds, a gold and silver medal, and a week's engagement at Putney Hippodrome. Now, the, another thing I'd like to tell you about, there was uh, the old London Shoreditch, or Shoreditch Empire, I don't know what you call it. Uh, about every month, they used to hold a special matinee for amateurs and semi-pros, or whoever liked to have a go. And I don't mind telling you, if they didn't like you, they used to give you the birds. And then the stagehands used to hook them off round the neck. Any <laughs> true. And uh, I went on there, and I did very well. And uh, as an old agent came up there, he had bumble feet with bunions, he had his boots all cut to give him a chance. He came clobbering up to me like this. And he booked me a week's engagement at another, another East End theatre called The Star, Bermondsey. Well, that was a jolly place too, I can tell you. <laughs> if anybody wore a collar and tie, they got mobbed. <laughs> it's a fact. Well, after that, I was, got an engagement, I think we got a pound a week all in. True, with a very successful juvenile team known as Parks Eaton Boys and Girton Girl, Girl One. And uh, there we were, dressed in bum freezers, and it looked as if butter wouldn't melt in our mouths. You know, it would, I can assure you. It did. And uh, <laughs> I'm used to go down to the front stump. <laughs> there in the twilight, cold and grey, life is beautiful, she lay. Excelsior, 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 Excelsior. Anyway, we did very well. So, by this time, you know, war being on, every time, the First World War, every time you saw soldiers or recruits going along, they saw a man in mufti, they used to chai out and say, why aren't you with us? Well, I tried several times to join up, and I eventually joined the London Scottish. That was before the rot set in. <laughs> yes. We had some, some pretty tough times, I don't mind telling you. Now, we, uh, first of all, we went to France. 
and things really were shocking, as you've probably seen on some of these films that are issued now and again. Really, conditions were diabolical. We used to live in mud up to there, and we were in kilts, don't forget. <laughs> and we didn't wear anything under mud. <laughs> it's true. There was a little North Country bloke. He, he joined up, and within a short while he was in trouble. He was brought before his commanding officer, being absent without leave, marched in by a sergeant major. So his officer looked at him and said, uh, Epsom T, he said, I don't mind if I do. <laughs> he said, uh, what is your name? He said, uh, Albert Edward Soddit. Albert Edward Soddit. He said, How came you to be christened that name? He said, The vicar caught his knee on the font. <laughs> well, he said, Private Soddit. He said, I, uh, I'm awarding you 28 days. That is, 14 days for the present offence and a further 14 for calling me a bastard. <laughs> he said, oh, I didn't call you a bastard, sir. He said, no, but you will do when you get outside. <laughs> After serving four years overseas, I was demobbed and uh, I came back into the business and the first job I got was in pantomime at the King's Theatre Hammersmith and of course the uh, comic's favourite part in pantomime is buttons. You, it's, you know, you've got to show pathos, be able to sing and dance, all that. It's, it's a lovely part and a very good one too. Now, another pantomime I was in, they had a children's fruit ballet. All the children were dressed representing different fruits. So one day, uh, just before the curtain was due to go up on this ballet in the second half, the matron went to the stage manager. She said, oh, Mr. Stage Manager, said, please, you, you can't ring the curtain up yet. He said, why not? She said, apricots wet herself. <laughs> You know, I was in my digs one morning, having my breakfast, and I suddenly got an idea for a song. And I went to the piano and I composed the melody and wrote the lyric, and I'm going to sing it for you now, and it's all about an old fisherman with a wooden leg. In a little village down in Devon There a quaint old man I know you'll see He's known to everyone And when his day is done You will always find him on the quay And they call him Peg Cos he's got a wooden leg And he used to sail a bark His leg they say went off one day Inside a great big shark He's a face that's red and ruddy And a tummy like a keg but they all like Peggy, dear old Peggy, with his Peggy leg. Oh, they call him Peg, cause he's got a wooden leg, and he used to say in the park. But watch old Peggy, dance old Peggy, with his Peggy leg. in the first show that opened 
the Prince Edward Theatre. And it was a show called Rio Rita. And I had a, a lovely dancing part in it. There it is. <laughs> See, there's no sound to it. <laughs> it still didn't stop me getting out of breath. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I shook a nifty foot in those days. <laughs> when I, years ago, well, when Variety was going, every music hall always opened with a troop of girls. I'd like to show you something on here. That's what they call the old time step. Now people, they often ask how the two Leslies came about. I used... <laughs> but, uh, we, we met because Leslie Holmes at that time, he was professional manager for a, a firm of music publishers. And in those days, the music publisher shops, uh, the shops were a hive industry. It had any amount of rooms, and from every room of different pianos playing, and somebody demonstrating a different song. It was like Bedlam. However, I got to know him through going up there, uh, publishing my songs, and uh, we, we had quite a long partnership. And, of course, uh, we used to do radio, music hall, records, films, and here's one of those films now. We wrote and sung in Radio Pie entitled I'm a Little Prairie Flower. Why was I born so beautiful? Why was I born so small? Why was I born so beautiful? Why was I born at all? Oh, I'm a little prairie flower, growing wild and free. Nobody cares to come to make me so I will wild and walk and be. They were very jolly. But what did they do in the winter time when there were no leaves but holly? Oh, little fairy stars, growing wild every hour. Nobody cares to come to make me so I would wild and walk and be. Wild and walk and be. Jack and Jill went up the hill and think they did daughter. Jill came down with half a crown. You think she went for water? I wish I had that lot now. <laughs> well, <coughs> when I did my variety act, uh, I included numbers like this. Watch this for the film. When he cuts himself a slice, I said, Joe, the Eskimo, he's got that in the belt. Oh, it's funny, he borrows money and tries to touch himself. Then he claps his hands and he stamps his feet. He lives on little bits of fish and tries to make it meat. Oh, I shall joke, the Eskimo has lately lost his nose, but he always says whenever it snows, jolly good luck to the Eskimo.
course, when I did my variety act, another song that I always had to do was The Old Sow. I suppose you'd like to hear a bit of it, would you? Yes. Right. Now there was an old farm, he had an old sow, and pfft, I did that. Susanna's a funny full man, and pfft, I did that. Susanna's a funny full man, sing Lassie go rings her alone. Susanna's a funny full man, and pfft, I did that. Susanna's a funny full man. Now this old sow, she had some little pigs, egg, egg, I did that. Susanna's a funny full man, and pfft, I did that. Susanna's a funny full man. Sing Lassie go rings her alone. Susanna's a funny full man. And <laughs> I do be that. Susanna's a funny full man. Now these little pink, they made the best of bacon. Bacon, bacon, I do be that. Susanna's a funny full man. And <laughs> I do be that. Susanna's a funny full man. Sing Lassie go rings her alone. Susanna's a funny full man. And <laughs> I do be that. Susanna's a funny full man. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, now, I'm sure I'm right in saying that practically everybody likes a little puppy dog. And uh, this, is, this monologue, it's all about a very cheeky little puppy dog, and he was known as Piddling Pete. As he trotted up the road, it was beautiful to see his work on every corner his work on every tree. He watered every gateway, never missed a post. For Piddling was his masterpiece. Yes, Piddling was his boast. The city dog stood looking on with deep and angry rage to see this simple country dog, the piddler of his age. <laughs> They smelt him over one by one. Their praise for him was high. But when one smelt him underneath, Pete piddled in his eye. Just to show the other dogs he didn't give a damn, he walked into the grocery shop and piddled on the hand. <laughs> he piddled on the onions. He piddled on the floor. When the grocer kicked his ass, he piddled on the door. Behind him, all the city dogs debated what to do. So they held a piddling carnival to see the stranger through. They showed him all the piddling posts they knew around the town. Then all set off with many winks to wear the stranger down. But Pete was there with every trick, with vigor and with vim. For a thousand piddles, more or less, were all the same to him. Yes, on and on went noble Pete, his hind leg kicking high, while most of them raised legs in bluff and piddled in the sky. <laughs> yes, on and on went noble Pete, he watered every sand hill till all the city champions were watered to a standstill. Then Pete an exhibition gave on all the ways to piddle, like double trips <laughs> and fancy flips. <laughs> and then a little dribble. <coughs> and all the wise dogs gathered there had neither wing nor grin. Pete blindly piddled out of town as he had piddled in. 
To them, Pete Piglin Reservoir remained a mystery. But on that day, young Pete, they say, created P-History. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now, please, please don't write in and ask for the words because they're not available. <laughs> now, <coughs> of course, when I was in my younger days, uh, going round the music halls, I used to meet all the great music hall stars, and they were always very kind to me, and uh, always found if you asked any advice, they were only too glad to give it to you like Florrie Ford. She, she was a, a wonderful woman. Then another, another very fine artist, a great Scottish comedian and character actor, Will Fife. He was a great man. He's the man that created I belong to Glasgow, dear old Glasgow You know it, don't you? Yes. Then another very fine comedian, George Roby, he was known as the Prime Minister of Mirth and a very generous man. When the show ended, he used to give beautiful presents to the other artists and his hobby was making violins and he made beautiful violins. Then another, another great artist I remember and knew very well, lovely woman, Mari Kendall, beautiful woman. And she was known for that lovely song. Just like the young of a on the old garden wall. They still want a bit of beating, don't they? <laughs> and even the youngsters know them. I, I also worked on the bill at Blackpool with the great Tom Mix. You remember the cowboy? And, and Tom Mix, he was rather fond of a drop of sherbet. And his, his Hampstead, his teeth used to rattle a bit. <laughs> and he, and when, when the, when the, <laughs> if a correspondent tried to get an interview, he never got any more than, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the, my variety, variety act and musicals, shows and all that sort of thing, I have now become a legitimate actor. An actor laddie, Peter Gill, who was a very well-known, very fine producer, rang me up and asked me if I'd like to play in Shakespeare. I thought he was pulling me leg. Well, I did. But, no, he wasn't. He was serious. And he, uh, he engaged me and cast me to play Adam in Shakespeare's As You Like It. And I did. We did it at the Playhouse Nottingham and then we went from there to the Edinburgh Festival where it was a great success. Well now, after that, I played in The Country Wife. Dear Doctor, hast thou done what I desired? I have undone you forever with the women and reported you throughout the whole town as bad as an eunuch with as much trouble as if I had made you one in earnest. Mm, but have you told all the midwives you know, the orange wenches at the playhouses, the city husbands, oh, and the old fumbling keepers of this end of town, for they'll be the readiest to report it? I have told all the chambermaids, waiting women, tire women, and old women of my acquaintance, nay, and whispered it as a secret to them, <laughs> and to the whisperers of Whitehall, so you need not doubt twill spread, and you will be as odious to the handsome young women as... as the smallpox! And well and to the married women of this end of the town. Well, as I say, I've done a lot of plays, but I've also done a lot of television. Now, you must admit, television's altered our whole way of life. It has, hasn't it? Yes. I mean, nowadays, if you call around to see a friend, before you get your foot inside the door, somebody says, turn it up. <laughs> They do, 
I was invited round to look at a programme some while ago. Sat in the dark for an hour, when the lights went up, I found out I was in the wrong house. <laughs> So I went up to the local to have one. While I was in there, I got into conversation with a Chinese gentleman. He informed me he was a great family man. I said, you're a great family man, eh? He said, yes, me great family man. I said, tell me, how many children have you? He said, 38. <laughs> I said, 38? He said, yeah. I said, good God, how'd you manage it? He said, me no telly. <laughs> Around about that time, I remember living next door to me, there was a very old man, and he prided himself that he'd never had to go to the doctor. However, eventually the day came when he found he had to go to the doctor. So he went to the doctor, and the doctor looked at him, and he said, uh, Good morning, Mr. Jones. He said, uh, What have you come to see me about? He said, Ho, 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 See you about my sex life. <laughs> she said, indeed, and what is your problem? He said, ho, 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 I can only make love for, for four times a week. <laughs> Doctor said, indeed, and uh, how old are you, Mr. Jones? He said, ho, 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 no, no, 98. <laughs> So you are 98 and you can only make love four times a week? Yes. Yeah. Allow me to tell you, I am only 48 and it takes me all my time to make love four times a month. <laughs> he said, oh, 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 I am coming to listen to your bloody troubles. <laughs> Now, I was also, I also uh, had a nice part in that uh, very successful uh, TV thing. I didn't know you cared. Now then, Stavely, you know what you have to do at the wedding? Is it uh, a wedding? Somebody getting married? I heard that, but... Yes, I'm getting married to... to... Olive Scrimshaw. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Ugliness personified. <laughs> I heard that pardon. <laughs> yes, well, don't laugh too hard, Stavely, or you'll knock the dewdrop off the end of your nose. <laughs> <clears throat> well, then I, I had a, a nice part in the Sweeney. Looks a bit and evil. I played an old yeah, soldier a evil. running on, a shop, you know, where they sold uniforms and badges and things. What do you want? We're looking for a pair. Car thieves. 18, 19, probably specialised in minis. One's called Billy. Try Jock. He might know him. Seen him. What about Stan Morris? And him. We've been all over. I've got a box full of these, you know. All the Indian regiments, you know, Gurkha, Sepoy. Honest? Yeah, it must be 30 or 40. You can have them. Yeah, I could drop them in tomorrow. No, I don't know. Mint condition. Good pencil. It's a lock-up, and I ain't never seen you. Cheers, soldier. Here, don't forget the badges. What's that right about the badges, Gov? Would I lie to an old soldier? <laughs> I also had the fortune to be in the first episode of that, of that lovely, that lovely programme, the, the Heriot one, all creatures great and small. 
Well, <coughs> I've been in show business well over 60 years, and I'm pleased to say I'm still working. And of course, I've written a lot of songs. And uh, I'm rather proud. This is a badge. It's the, it's the badge, the golden badge of honor presented by the Songwriters Guild. <laughs> As I said, I've had over 150 of my songs published and I'd like to finish up with a medley of some of the most popular of my songs. Now the first one I wrote for a Palladium pantomime and it was sung by Tommy Trinder. Strolling down the strand With a banana in my hand Hey ho, away we go Boys and gals, jolly good pals All in a row We go hand in hand And we don't need any big brass band Spirits high as we cry Ity iddly ity it Strolling down the dear old strand Now this next one I wrote and recorded and it sold a million records. Lightly there's nothing but trouble, grief and strife. There's not much attraction about this blooming life. Last night I dreamt I was blooming well dead. As I went to the funeral of blooming well said, hey, look at the flowers. Blooming great orchids, great great to be blooming dead. Hey, look at the coffee. Blooming great angles, great great to be blooming dead. I felt so happy to think that I popped off. I said to a bloke with a nasty hacking cough, Look at the blackbirds, blooming great horses. Why the great to be blooming dead? Hey, look at my sister, blooming you at all. Why the great to be blooming dead? Hey, look at my brother, blooming cigar on. Why the great to be blooming dead? We come from clay and we all go back, they say. So don't chuck a brick, it might be your Auntie May. Look at me, Grandma. Bloody old Abe. <laughs> I ain't the grand to be blooming world day. <laughs> now, this last one has become a standard work and is played or sung almost every day somewhere by someone. I had the honour of having it played by all the bands of Her Majesty's Guards, also the band of the Royal Corps of Signals, and I was also allowed to conduct the band. When the guards are on parade in the union, Blanket lines as a sergeant, do you think you're in? It's not the boys brigade. When the guards are on parade and the band is being played, the bayonets are flashing, the sergeant's teeth are gnashing. When the guards are on parade, when the guards are on parade, in the uniform parade. Blanket and blanket, the sergeant, do you think you're in? It's not the boy brigade. But when the guards are on parade and the band is being played, the bayonets are flashing, the sergeant's teeth are gnashing. When the guards are
The name of Percy Edwards is synonymous with bird and animal imitations, an uncanny and unusual skill which enabled him to carve a particular niche in the world of entertainment. In next week's Old Boy Network, at the earlier time of nine o'clock, Percy Edwards looks back over the 50 years of his career and describes the background to his talented specialism. There's a new season of collecting coming to BBC Two. Penny Juner, Gwyn Richards and Harriet Crawley discover the joys of collecting now. A new series capturing the fun and fever of collecting all kinds of objects and meeting collectors around the country. The series ranges from Indian silver and mechanical toys to Art Deco glass and early bicycles. And there's advice on the care and maintenance of special treasures. From the beautiful and the bizarre, it all rolls up in Collecting Now, starting in...